Well, good morning, everybody. How are you all doing today? Good. Well, today, I'm continuing a series that we've been doing over the past couple of weeks. It's a series called Stranger Things. And this has been kind of a unique series. What we've aimed to do in this series is take passages of Scripture that are not usually the ones that you hear about, okay? So passages of Scripture that maybe make you scratch your head a little bit. Uh, These are the ones that might make us uncomfortable, you know, might not seem to line up with the rest of Scripture, might be really confusing for us to to understand. And we've been trying to kind of crack these verses open, crack these parts open, and get to the truth that is inside them. Um, If I could get my second slide up here. Uh, 2 Timothy 3.16 says, All of Scripture is God-breathed and useful for teaching, rebuking, correcting, and training in righteousness. And this is true for all of Scripture. This is true for everything that we come across. That's even the parts that make us uncomfortable. You know, they're, they're even the so-and-so begat so-and-so and so-and-so begat so-and-so. There's actually, there's value to everything that we find in Scripture. And so we're trying to kind of get at some of the harder to find value uh, th- throughout this series. And so I want to talk about a saying. And I'm wondering if anybody has ever heard this saying before. It's kind of, it's an old one. It's made its rounds. You know, it's appeared in churches from time to time. And uh, I don't know if anybody's ever heard this. Have you ever heard when you're talking about reading the Bible, the idea of eating the meat and spitting out the bones? Raise your hand if you've ever heard that before. Okay, so a few of you, right? Okay, so yeah, that, that is, it's a saying that, you know, has been around for a long time and is basically the analogy here is that when you're reading scripture, um, it's kind of a bit like eating a meal. Okay, so we're trying, in, you know, in the sense that like we read scripture to try and, you know, grow and maintain ourselves spiritually. We eat a meal to try and uh, grow and maintain ourselves physically. And so if you're eating meat, for example, you know, you're going through a steak and you come across a bone, you don't throw the whole steak out because, oh, there's a bone in it. This, this steak is ruined, right? You kind of, you, you set the, the bone aside and you continue. And uh, that is, that's how, th- what this analogy is kind of used to say, the idea that you don't get daunted by the harder passages of scripture and stop it from letting you get to what's good in scripture. Now that said, there is some wisdom there. It's a good idea, you know, not to let that stop you from getting to the rest of scripture. But we misuse this saying and this idea a fair bit nowadays. Um, This saying, actually, the idea of eating the meat and spitting out the bones came from a different time in history, okay? It was a very different sort of way of dealing with the bones when you ate food, okay? Uh, There was a time when people would not throw their bones out, but they would actually save them and use them for stew, for, for creating like a broth or for a soup. I don't know if anybody does that right now. I'm not trying to make you feel old or anything like that. <laughs> but in general, that's not what we do today. Like culturally, that's not how we, how we deal with it. My grandma used to do this, and it deeply disturbed me when I was a kid. I remember being like, guys, I don't want to freak anybody out, but grandma has a bag full of bones in her refrigerator. Okay, I think she might be losing it, right? Like that... That's what I thought was going on. But as it turns out, right, she came from a time and a culture when people wouldn't waste their bones. They understood that there was value to that and that there was something that they could be gained from keeping those. And the original saying, I spent forever trying to find where it actually came from. Um, the earliest person I found saying it or writing it was C.S. Lewis, but he didn't come up with it. it, it was, <laughs> but he, he does say it. And when he uses the quote, he says, um, maybe one day I will find that even a bone can give me sustenance. Maybe one day I will find that even a bone can give you me sustenance. So today we want to eat our meat we want to, and throw away our bones, right? And that's how we like to go through Scripture sometimes. There's a strong feeling in the church and in society as a whole that you can pick and choose what you like from the Bible. But that's not the idea of this saying. That's not a, a respectful way to go through Scripture. And so today what we're going to do is we're going to take one of these verses and we're going to try to make some stew out of this bad boy. All right? With that said... The verse that I have been given today. (laughs) Guys, the verse that I've been given today. Okay. On a Venn diagram of confusing verses, verses that make us uncomfortable and verses that conflict with the rest of Scripture, I've located it for your convenience. (laughs) Right here, smack dab in the middle of all of it. Um, This is a bone, okay? If there was ever a bony verse in Scripture, this is probably it. And uh, I don't see any way for us to ease into it. I I don't see any way that I can make this more bearable for you. Ha, bearable. That's actually a clever pun you just don't know yet because I haven't gotten to it. But (laughs) hold on. Um, Yeah, so 
I don't see any way to like ease us into it. So what we're going to do is we're going to dive right into the verse. We're going to read it, and then we're going to go from there, okay? So this is it, 2 Kings 2, 23 to 25, all right? So from there, Elisha went up to Bethel, and as he was walking along the road, some boys came out of the town and jeered at him. Okay, all right, so far so good. Get out of here, Baldy, they said. Get out of here, Baldy. And then he turned around, looked at them, and called down a curse on them in the name of the Lord. Okay. Then two bears came out of the woods and mauled 42 of the boys. And he went on his way to Mount Carmel and from there returned to Samaria. <laughs> okay. So you can imagine how excited I am to be up here today and to talk to you about this. Uh, yeah, this is a challenging verse, okay? This is a really tough one. This is not something you're going to hear preached on your average Sunday, okay? But this is not an unknown verse. If you went looking for this verse, where you would find it is uh, on forums for new atheists. Uh, you're going to find it on anti-Christian websites. You're going to find it in Richard Dawkins' The God Delusion. Uh, you know, that coworker that you finally got to read the Bible, he's going to text this to you at midnight one day with a question mark beside it, right? That's, that's, that's the kind of thing that we're going to deal with here. This is a verse that, that you know, people who don't like faith, people who are trying to kind of disprove uh, Christianity, they love this verse. And you can see why, right? Because there are a lot of red flags when we read through this verse. We come up to a lot of questions. Uh, I mean, first of all, does this not seem like an unnecessarily harsh response, right? I mean, look, I have a beautiful full head of hair, okay? I've never understood the pain of being bald. But in my limited experience, okay, with baldies in my own social circle, uh, brutal mauling by bear, not an appropriate response to having it mentioned, okay? It's just, it's just not. It, as a matter of fact, at any point in your life, if someone has done something to you and you find yourself orchestrating they're getting mauled by a bear, ask yourself the question, am I overreacting? <laughs> Because the answer is probably, yeah, yeah, a little, okay? That's, yeah, it seems like just way too big of a response for something that is too small. And then another question we have is when we read this word boys, right? Like that's a disturbing word to read. We kind of get this picture of like a group of kindergartners coming out, right? And they're yelling, go away, baldy. And it really matches with the taunt, right? That sounds like something that a bunch of little kids would come up with. And so that's a disturbing thought. We ask the question, are these a bunch of kids? And the third question we have like, or that really comes to mind for me is, the same sort of question that we have every time we come across verses like this, right? When we see God using violence to advance his kingdom, to advance his plan in the Bible, right? We ask the question, are, is he justified in doing that? And in this case, it's not even just, you know, violence. He's not just snapping his fingers and someone's dying. This is gratuitous violence. Like, this is scary stuff. And we ask the question, is that ever right? Can God ever be justified in doing that? And these are big questions, and they're hard questions, right? We get, un yeah, right. We get uncomfortable with all the smiting. We don't like it when people get smote. Um, <laughs> but these are big questions, right? These are hard questions for us to answer. And so today, as we go through the sermon, it's going to be a little different than our average sermon, okay? I'm going to be a little bit light on application. We are going to get to it. We are going to get to it in the end. But... Um, it's going to be a little bit more theological. And the reason is because I don't want to be pandering. You know, I don't want to stand up here and kind of say like, oh, well, the message is that God really cares and protects his about, or cares about and protects his people, right? And that's it, right? You, you would naturally say that does not answer any of the questions that you have today. And so I'm, we're going to do a bit of theology. There's a word study in this sermon. You know, it, 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 I will try to keep it as interesting as I can. But I want us to answer these questions. I know you guys probably want some answers too. So we're going to go into that. All right, so what we're going to start with is just a little bit of context to lessen our load of questions here, all right? So Elisha, the character in our story, he is the student of Elijah. Uh, I'm going to mess their names up like six times while I'm doing this because they're way too similar. So Elijah is the teacher and Elisha is the student and he's the character in the story here who calls down the curse. Now Elijah has just ended his prophetic ministry and he was called by God away from where he was into Bethel. Uh, and he was called there so that he could be taken up into heaven. Now, this is a rare kind of honor. There are a few people in the Bible who, get, who actually get taken up into heaven. I'm not 100% sure on how it works. It seems like they kind of don't die. God's just like, get on up here, and they kind of, they go. So Elijah, he went up in a whirlwind and chariots of fire right before this, this passage here. And as he left, uh, he gave a double portion of his power, of his, of his kind of connection to God, to, to Elisha, his student. And essentially, he made him the next prophet. He said, you are the next spokesperson, you know, for the God of Abraham. And what's weird uh, 
among a million other things. What's weird about this passage is that this all happened in Bethel, okay? If I could get the map up, actually. Bethel is just a little bit north of Jerusalem, which is kind of where you'd think something like this would happen, right? The temple of God's there. You know, that's kind of the God place. That's, what's gonna, that's where it would happen. But God actually called Elijah up to Bethel to go up to ascend into heaven. And what's weird is that Bethel at this time was not like a God-affiliated city. It was actually, most notably, at this time in history, a place of idol worship. All right? So the, the nation of Israel at this time was split into two kingdoms. It was Israel in the north and Judah in the south. And in Judah, they had Jerusalem. All right? So that's where the temple of God is, and that's where people would kind of go for like ceremonies and, and festivals and stuff like that. And so they would bring from Israel, people who were going to worship the God of Abraham would bring all their wealth and their goats and whatever other stuff they had that constituted wealth, and they would bring it down to Jerusalem. And the king of Israel at that time didn't like it. His name was Jeroboam, and he wanted to keep all of the wealth in his kingdom. And so what he did was he established golden calf worship, okay? And he established it in two cities, Dan in the north for everybody there, and then he established it in Bethel in the south as well. And his idea, his plan there was that as people were traveling south to go and worship the God of the Bible, they'd get sidetracked. They'd be like, we've got a perfectly good golden cow right here. You know, let's bow down and worship here, right? So that essentially what he did was he kind of created the McDonald's of spirituality, right? Like, is it the same quality? No, but it's cheap and it's convenient. So people kind of go there, right? And in both versions, not a real cow. So, right? Better analogy than you maybe thought at first. <laughs> Yeah, so that's what's happened. And so as a result, Bethel was a dangerous place for a prophet of, Ab of, of the God of Abraham. Okay, Bethel, there would have been a lot of zealots there. There would have been a lot of people who were trying to defend and prove that their faith was stronger than the God of the Bible. And so they would have been willing to beat up Elisha. They would have been willing to kill Elisha to try and prove their God's superiority. This is the thing that we see throughout the Old Testament. There's these conflicts of gods. And so that's, that's kind of an interesting aspect that they, they're in Bethel, which is a very strange city for this to happen. All right, so the second thing that I want to talk about to kind of lessen some of our questions is this word boys. All right, um, a lot of translations of the Bible, yes, this is, words are fun, guys, okay? We're going to get through this. A lot of translations in the Bible, uh, they translate it boys. Um, some translate, it, translate the word lads, uh, others young men, but it, we're right to translate it boys. There are three words that actually are used to describe these young men here in this passage. And the words, I'm going to butcher them because I cannot actually pronounce Hebrew, but they're, they're katan which means small in size, age, or importance. Nar, which means boy or girl, but it's in a range of ages and is applied to lots of different ages throughout the Bible. And yeled, which means someone's offspring. So these three words are used to describe these men here. Now, throughout the Bible, in the Old Testament, there is a precedent for people being called these words who are grown men. Okay, so... Uh, people who were called Katan. We have Benjamin, who was Jacob's son. Uh, because he was the youngest son of Jacob, he was called Katan just because he was the youngest, even though he was a grown man at the time that they talk about him. Saul, when he becomes king over Israel, he calls himself Katan in two places. Uh, and that's to kind of say that he felt unworthy to the task, right? He was a grown man, but he felt you know, he, was, uh, he was too small for what was placed before him. Um, and then we've got Hadad the Edomite, who's called Katan Nar. So that's a combination of the two words. And Solomon as well, who's called Katan Nar. And uh, Solomon said this about himself in humility, and Hadad the Edomite has actually called this in the story. And that is actually a, it's kind of a way to show that they're, though they were grown men, that they were inexperienced, that they made rash and foolish decisions, you know, that they, that they weren't really thinking right. And so um, there is a precedent in the Old Testament, in Hebrew scriptures, for grown men being called these things in an attempt to say, these are foolish people right? These, these are people who aren't thinking straight. And uh, so, look, the word that we rightfully translate boys, because, I mean, if you look at all those things, you know, what English word would you translate into it? Prob translate it into probably boys, right? But when we read that word, we freak out. When a Hebrew reader would have read that word back in the time that it was written, like for the people whom it was written for, they would have understood that it could very easily mean, you know, less a group of preschoolers or whatever, but more it's like a gang of ho soccer hooligans, right? That's what's coming after them here. And so this word boys should not cause us as much, uh, <coughs> as many sleepless nights. Sorry, everybody. <laughs> it should not cause us as many sleepless nights as it does. All right. So the third thing that I want to talk about uh, if we can move on to the next slide, because I totally forget what it is. Oh, yes. 
<laughs> the imprecise but very scientific math of bear attacks. Okay, so while their taunt, go away Baldy, does not make me think of anything threatening, like I, I don't understand. I assume there must have been other things said as well, but for whatever reason, this is the one the Bible chooses to give us. Um, what does make me think that this group might have been threatening is the number of them that were there. Okay, so 42 people. It doesn't say how many people were there, but it says 42 people got mauled by bears. And I'm not an expert on bear attacks, but I have an understanding that if two or three people get mauled, everybody else will run away. I don't know, have you ever heard the joke, there's two campers walking through the woods and they come across a bear. The bear gets up, it starts looking threatening, it's growling, it's got its claws out. And the one camper, he bends over and he starts to tie his shoe. And his buddy looks at him and he says, what are you doing? You can't outrun a bear. And he looks at his friend and he says, I don't have to outrun a bear. I just have to outrun you. <laughs> right? <laughs> okay. Well, by that logic, right, more people must have escaped than got mauled by bears, which makes us, you know, estimate the full crowd in the hundreds somewhere, right? So either there were so many people that 42 people is a reasonable percent for two bears to be able to maul, or there was a smaller number of people, but they didn't leave. They were willing to fight. They were willing to try and get through these bears just to get to Elisha until 42 of them got mauled, then they had to run away. Either way, it's probably a threatening situation that Elisha was in. All right, so this gives us a bit of context. This helps a lot with the questions that we have, all right? This, and oftentimes, guys, when you come across a bony verse in the Bible, study is something that helps. Study helps us to inform our understanding. We see the Bible through the context of our own culture, through our own time, through our own life experience. You know, and a lot of things that would have been easy for people, you know, who it was originally written to to understand, you know, we can miss. And so study really does help us in these instances. But look, we're still left with a lot of questions, right? There are still a lot of things that we're, we're unsure of here. And look, a lot of times, even when you study a scripture that might bother you, even when you find the context, even when you work everything out in the history, you're still going to be stuck with some questions. Sometimes nothing is going to change. You're just going to come to the fact that the verse is telling you something you don't want to hear. And this is where there's a difference, okay, between the kind of people who are reading the Bible as an authority, okay, the people who are reading it as something that will inform your lives and help you learn how to live something that is, is God-breathed um, and that we consider to be sacred, and someone who's reading the Bible either, you know, from an atheist perspective or someone who thinks, you know, it's just a good book with some nice morals in it, right? This is where the line is drawn, okay, because it would be very easy for us to study this whole verse out of existence, right? It's very tempting. We could, we could do this. We could say, oh, God wouldn't do something like that, so it's just a metaphor, right? You know, Elisha represents Israel, and the bears represent, you know, God's judgment or wrath or whatever, and then the others all represent the rest of the nation. We could do that. We could say, it's just, it's just a metaphor. It's not a real story. We could say, you know, back in the day, there were all kinds of hardships that people went through, and, uh, and, and they didn't understand, you know, how, why life would be so hard. And so sometimes they would write God in to tragedies that occurred in real life. So there was a bear attack, and then they came back later, and they said, oh, well, God did it to kind of come to terms with their grief, and that's why it happened. It's not a real story, right? But look, when we start doing this, we are walking on some very dangerous ground. We're back to the idea of wanting to eat our meat and throw away our bones instead of just saving them for later, okay? And this is a very dangerous thing for us to do because, listen, when we start picking and choosing what we want to accept out of the Bible, we would almost be better to just choose not to listen to it at all Okay, when we start picking and choosing what we want to take and what we want to leave out of the Bible, we'd almost be better not to worry about it. Because listen, what we do when we start picking our verses is we stop allowing the Bible to be an authority in our lives. We stop allowing it to be something that informs how we live. And we start using it to back up the moral decisions that we've made. So we decide how we want to live. We look through the Bible and we find verses that back us up and throw away everything else that doesn't really, that doesn't support us. Ooh, I, I do that. Oh, that doesn't count. That doesn't matter. Ooh, oh, but I look really good by this verse, so that's definitely one of the real ones, right? And it's dangerous because, look, we expect other people to respond when we use the Bible to back up our behavior as, oh, they used a scripture. Oh, oh, good. Okay, you're definitely right. But if somebody challenges us with scripture that way, then we go, oh, that one's not real right? And it's the ultimate hypocrisy. We become worse than a person who just does whatever they want and doesn't care what the Bible says because we become people who do whatever we want and then act like we have God's authority to do it. 
That's a very dangerous place for us to be. And listen, if we, are, we profess to be believers, if we profess to be people who follow Jesus Christ, then we owe it to ourselves, we owe it to the church, and we owe it to the scriptures to give it a bit more respect than that. And so we're going to take a second pass at this verse, at some of the questions that we have, um, and we are going to, you know, we're going we're to look at some of the remaining questions, and I'm going to show you a couple tools that we have that will help us to maybe uh, look at these bony verses in Bible while maintaining the authority of Scripture. So the questions that we still have, my big question is, you know, still, how can a loving God respond in so violent a manner? Like, why didn't God just teleport Elisha? Right? Why didn't he just temporarily blind all those guys? In Luke, we have a very different story about Jesus getting cornered by a mob. Jesus gets cornered by a mob here. It says, they got up, drove him out of town, took him to the brow of a hill on which the town was built in order to throw him off the cliff. Very clear danger, right? And then it says, but he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. What? Well, were there no bears around? Like, I, I don't understand. Why such a, like a, a generous, you know, kind response in one instance and then such a violent response in the other instance? We're still stuck with that question. Is God justified in using violence, in using, like, horrible things to advance his means? And I want to talk about two considerations that will help us to deal with this question, okay? And they work together. The first is this. We need to see everything in the Bible through the full character of God that is revealed in the whole of Scripture, Okay, so every individual moment that we read in the Bible, we need to bear in mind, keep in mind, um, <laughs> we need to keep in mind God's entire character as it's revealed in the Bible. Okay, so listen, if I'm walking through the supermarket and I bump into somebody and that person turns to me and they just start swearing at me and screaming at me and spitting and they're just livid, right? I can only judge that person by what I know about them right there. I don't know them from anybody. All I know is they're the mean person who hurt my sensitive little heart with their sharp, pointy words, right? And so that's how I'm going to judge that situation. <clears throat> but if I'm walking through my house and I bump into my wife and she turns to me and starts, you know, swearing and spitting and yelling at me and all that kind of stuff, I'm going to have a very different understanding of that situation, right? Because that is not something that my wife does, guys, okay? It's just not. I'm going to imagine, I'm going to assume that there's a context there, right? That there's something happening that's making her act out of character. So I'm not just going to run away crying, right? Like I'm, I'm going to ask her what's wrong, give her a hug, maybe give her some chocolate or something. I don't, I don't know. We, <laughs> something. And uh, so that, right, so you can see how our understanding of a person's character changes the way we see how they're acting in individual moments. We're able to kind of understand that there must be more going on or understand the context that way. And the second thing that works with the first is this, that we need to remember that we do not have the same understanding as God. Okay, we need to remember that we don't know the same things that God knows, right? His understanding is greater than us. He's outside of time. You know, he's om omniscient. He knows everything. He's, he's everywhere. There's nothing happening that he is not privy to. And we, we don't have that kind of understanding of the world. And uh, so to, il to illustrate this, <clears throat> I've created a chart. Um, my children, when I tell them it's time to go home from a fun activity, you will see here that the more fun an event is, the higher the probability is of a horrifying fit. All right, and so on an unrelated note, as their father, I've decided we're staying home and eating broccoli for the rest of our lives, but it's a totally different story. Um, right, but this, this is generally what kind of happens. And so when I tell my kids, you know, we have to go home, guys, you got to pack up, right? The reason that they stomp their feet and cry and get angry is because they lack the understanding that I have. Right? Like, I have a better understanding of the situation than them. I know that you can't keep going down the slide forever because it's going to get boring. And it happens to mommy and daddy first, but it'll eventually happen to you, right? And so we have to get out of here. <laughs> um, right? I, I understand that we have to go home and eat. We have to go home and sleep. I know we can come back later, but they don't understand that, right? They lack that understanding. And as a result, you know, they can disagree with me. You know, they can get mad. They can be upset and not really, they can genuinely think you know, that they, they or have a dis different idea about what we should be doing. But listen, because they know my character, they can still trust me, right? So, so the thought pr process could go, you know, daddy seems like he's being mean, but I know daddy's a good daddy, so he's probably doing what's best for me. Now, I'm not delusional. I know my kids have never had that actual thought process, <laughs> you know, when, when they're 30 and they have their own kids, maybe. But but you can see how that's a reasonable way to respond, right? Well, that's a reasonable way to view the situation. That's a reasonable way for us 
to view God, right? We have a different understanding than him, so we then look to his character to inform us. And so we're going to take a second pass at this verse. We're going to go through it one more time. And I want to apply this to the verse, okay? I'm sorry, guys. Here we go. Um, so in the verse, we've, we've just got Elisha. He's in this dangerous situation. And, um, you know, these guys have come out. They've kind of surrounded him. And he calls down this curse. And now we know God can respond however he wants to to a person's prayer, even if it's his prophet, right? Like he chooses how he responds. And God chooses to respond in this instance with she bears. That's, that's what he does. And um, what we normally want to do when we're trying to decide if, you know, if something's morally justified or not is we put ourselves in that situation, right? So we would say, okay, if I had the ability to handle this any of the ways that God could have, would it be right for me to respond with bears? And guys, the answer is no, right? Of course not. Of course, we would be morally justified in doing whatever would cause the least amount of damage, okay? But God chooses to respond with bears. And what we know is that there's a difference in our understanding between him and us. And we also know that God's morality is perfect, right? That God is going to do what's morally right in every situation. And so we're left with only one possible conclusion, and it's this. And it's going to be a little weird, but we're going to get through it. The conclusion is, apparently, God doesn't follow all the same rules that we do. Okay? Apparently, there are some things that are morally wrong in our hands that could be morally right in God's hands. And you say, Tyler... That's ridiculous. That's not how morality works. Everybody, morality, there are right things and there are wrong things, and it's the same for everybody. I'm going to challenge you. I'm going to say that is not actually how it works, okay? We actually understand this to the point that we have a phrase for this. We will say about somebody, oh, that person's playing God, right? And when we say a person's playing God, what do we mean? We mean that that person is bending rules, breaking rules that only God should be allowed to break, that only God should be allowed to bend. In our society right now, there are all kinds of people who do things that the average person is not allowed to do. And it's not because our morals are backwards. It's not because, you know, things are messed up and those people are cheating everybody. It's because they have specific knowledge and specific training that has given them a special authority to do something. Okay, so a police officer can run through a red light. They can carry a gun. Boxers can beat each other up inside a boxing ring without any consequences. A doctor can cut into a person and take out their organs. Okay, if a random person on the street did that, you would have concerns, right? You really would. You would probably call them a criminal. So why is a doctor allowed to do it? Are we wrong? Are our morals all messed up? No. The reason is because a doctor knows things that the average person doesn't know, so they have the authority to do that. We're okay with that as a society. Now listen, the difference between God's authority in making decisions and our authority in making decisions is a thousand times, a billion times bigger than the difference between you allowing your doctor to perform a surgery on you and just a random guy you met on the street. It's a much bigger difference than that. And I'm going to quickly go through three different ways that there is, that God has unique authority. And then, and then we're done. Then we, get to, then we get to the application and we're just going to finish. But I'm going to go through three unique ways that God has special authority to give you an idea about what I'm talking about here, okay? So God can make consequentialist decisions, all right? And what that means is decisions where the ends justify the mean. And he can do this because he, he knows the future, Right? We can try to do this as human beings, right? When we don't have a really clearly good choice and it's kind of everything's a little gray, right? We can try and do the thing that will hurt less or the thing that might cause the least damage, but we don't know the future. We don't know what's going to happen. And so, you know, we're only justified in doing that to a certain extent, right? So God can destroy Sodom and Gomorrah in the Bible, for example, because he's able to say how much human suffering will happen if I let this city remain versus how much human suffering will exist if I don't, if I destroy this city, right? On the other hand, you know, come jamboree time, you know, if we look at Havelock and say, no, this has to end, right? We are not justified in <laughs> destroying that. And so, so that, that's not okay, right? That's not justifiable for us, but it's justifiable for God to make those kinds of decisions because he can see what's going to happen in the future and he can weigh the pros and cons. It's worth talking about, thinking about the idea that a hundred years from the story that we're focusing on here today, Assyria comes in, because of idol worship, Assyria comes in and wipes out the, na the kingdom of Israel. They're going to take people into slavery. They're going to kill thousands of people. And that's a direct result of the people's idol worship. All right? And so here, a massive victory for the God of Abraham, a massive display of power, could be a thing that saved an entire generation from that kind of bloodshed. Right? We don't know what calculations were going on here, but we do know that, you know, if God had let Elisha just walk through the crowd, the prophets of the golden calf could have gone, yeah, you better run. But it's hard to get 42 of your people mauled by bears and say, we'll call it a draw. So, right, that's, that's what's going on. 
And so it's possible that God made those kinds of calculations to make a consequentialist decision. Also, God can make sympathetic decisions. And here that doesn't mean that he feels sorry for somebody and then makes a decision based on that. It means he knows what's going on in a person's heart and mind. All right? And we, we don't. We know people's actions. That's pretty much the most that we get to see from them. And we try to infer what's going on in their heart and mind from it. Okay? So, and, and, but we understand that what matters is what's going on inside a person's heart and mind. Let me give you an example. If a person kills somebody in cold blood, or if a person accidentally kills somebody, we react to that very differently. Why? The same thing happened. It was the same action. The reason is because there's something different going on in the heart and minds of those two people, right? And so God, while we can kind of just see people's actions, we're not really even honest about what our own motivations are, you know, what's going on in our own heart and minds. God knows what's going on beneath the surface with people. And so you'll see in the Bible, he reacts to things very differently for different people sometimes, right? So Jesus asks the rich young ruler to give away all of his possessions, but he's really happy when Zacchaeus gives away half right? Uh, Peter lies three times, says he doesn't know who Jesus is. And Jesus says, you know what? You're the rock on which I'm going to build my church. Ananias and Sapphira lie one time about what they gave to the church and God strikes them dead right in that instance, right? There are different responses. And the reason is very likely because God understands what's going on in the hearts and minds of those people while we don't. So we don't know what's going on in the subtext of this story, right? We don't know what's going on in the hearts and minds of the people in this story who get attacked by these bears. So it might have been something there. And the third thing, that I want to talk about is that God can make terminal decisions, okay, which is to say that God has the authority to make life and death decisions. And the reason is because, well, one of the reasons anyway, among all these, is that God, his morality is fixed, okay? God, what he thinks is right at the beginning of time is the same thing that God thinks is right now, is the same thing that God will think is right 10 billion years from now, right? You and me, we're going to change, right? We've changed a lot already, you know, as, as we go through life, as we grow, and as we learn, our morality changes. What we think is right and what we think is wrong will, will differ. As a society, this happens, right? We're much more in tune with the idea of racism now than we were maybe a generation ago. Maybe much less in tune as a society with the idea of sexual immorality, right? Like, I mean, that's just, that's, as our society changes its views morally. And so it's worth asking this question. When we want to judge God by human moral standards, it's worth asking, which human moral standard are we judging him by? Which country? Which time? Right? I mean, are we, are we judging him according to Israel at the time that this happened? Or are we judging him according to our, our moral principles now in North America? Or 50 years from now, we're going to look back on what we thought and say, ha, huh, those barbarians, I can't believe they ever believed that, right? We are essentially kind of the equivalent of a, of a seven-year-old saying, I know as good as my mommy and daddy now because I'm not a silly six-year-old anymore, right? You know when that kid turns eight, they're going to say the exact same thing about seven-year-olds, right? Our morality changes. God's morality is fixed. And so he's okay to make final decisions in that sense. And so these are three reasons why God might have special authority to make decisions. And listen, um, so we're going to come to, can I get the next slide? Thank you. Yeah, so he has unique authority to make these decisions, okay? Um, <sighs> Corinthians, right here, Corinthians 125 puts it this way. It says, the foolishness of God is wiser than human wisdom, and the weakness of God is stronger than human strength. Okay, we, don't, we don't understand and, uh, uh, how God makes his decisions. There is a difference there. He has special authority. And so listen, when we come across bones, and this is it, guys. This is it. This is what I want you to take home, okay? We're here. We've made it. And so if you can just remember this part, this is good. When we come across bones in the Bible and when we come across bones in life, okay? When we come across those times when we're just like, what was God thinking? Why are you doing this, right? Listen, we can react in one of two ways. We can choose to forget that there is a difference between our understanding and his understanding. Okay? And we can judge him as humans. We can judge him with our, our limited knowledge of what's going on, our, our limited guesses of the future. You know, we can judge him with, with our uh, misunderstandings about people and what we don't really know what's going on with their actions and their motivations, not really even honesty about ourselves. We can judge him um, you know, w with a morality that's kind of uh, wishy-washy and changes sometimes that people could talk us out of tomorrow, right? Or right, we could judge him that way. We can, we can live that way. Or we can recognize that he's God and we're not. That there's a difference between what we understand and what he knows. And we can fill that gap with what we know about his character. All right? So when we come across the bones in scripture, as we read the Bible, you know, and we come across those hard parts, 
we can set them aside instead of throwing them out. And as we're hungry for God, as we come back, as we seek him, as we learn about him, we can learn how to gain nutrients from those. We can learn how to grow from even those hard parts of scripture. But in the meantime, between then and now, we can recognize that he is God and we are not. And we can fill that space with faith if we choose to. That's all I've got for you guys today. <laughs> um, so will you bow your heads with me and we'll pray and then we'll do some question and answer because I'm sure you guys have some. All right. Dear God, <laughs> thank you for your word. God, thank you for all the challenges that are inside it. Lord God, thank you for the fact that, uh, that it's something that keeps us curious, that it's something that keeps us coming back, Lord, that there is always something new to learn and something new to explore. Lord God, thank you for the fact that you challenge us with it. Uh, Lord God, we just, uh, we pray that we would be up to the challenge. And God, we pray that as we go through your word, and Lord God, that as we go through life, we would be people who respond to the things that we don't understand with faith. Lord God, that we would trust in you uh, with just a passionate faith, Lord God, that we would just be able to, to know that you are good in all things. And Father God, we pray this, uh, and that would be the attitude that we walk out of here with today, Lord, and we pray that in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, guys, questions. Does anybody have any questions? Anything that you want answered? I've given you all the knowledge that I have, so I have nothing to give you now. But <laughs> yes, Dave. Maybe, maybe Tyler, uh, while uh, qu people are asking questions, making comments, if we could ask the basket people to uh, basket shoot the baskets people. around. Yes. Light colored ones first. They're the ones that you take uh, envelopes and information out of. And the darker colored ones that come along uh, after those. They will be the ones that uh, you can put uh, envelopes back in. Or uh, if you want to be on a mailing list for KCC, you can put it in there. If you're visiting here today, uh, sorry, we don't expect get... you to put anything in the <laughs> offering envelope. Off. You're our guest today. So as those go around, if you have a question, stick up your hand. Grace. Okay, again, remember, hold the mic, touch your chin with it. The difference <laughs> is you'll be able to hear versus you won't be able to hear it. Okay, so touch your chin. Uh, whenever you were, we were talking about the golden calf, yeah. um, I was reading this book a little while ago, and it said that um, when, do you remember when Aaron, Moses went up the mountain to get the law, and the uh, people yeah. down below got led away by Aaron, or persuaded, somebody persuaded Aaron anyway, yeah, to, to make calf. a golden calf. And anyway, it said in the book that um, calf worship was a predominantly an Egyptian thing. Oh. So, interestingly enough, here's these people that God is miraculously, with all those ten plagues, you know, right. given a severe warning to uh, Egypt to let the people go, and they experience all that, and then they have this amazing thing, they go through the Red Sea, you know, <laughs> mm -hmm. and that must have been so dramatic, right? Because they're about to die after all those ten plagues. But anyway, God leads them through, and then shortly after that, they make this gold calf, you can see that like they're just going backwards right and i think sometimes god has to do something really severe not because he's um hateful but because he's if, if, if it isn't severe nobody's going to pay attention sure yep and uh, even so israel continued like turning back to idols again and again and again right. and here they are with how many centuries have passed and they've got elijah or elijah <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, so I, I can see it from that perspective. Yeah. And thanks very much for all that research. It was really interesting. Really no appreciate it. Thanks. <laughs> Mike, <laughs> we got one. And then I'll, I think that might be it because we do have to, yeah. unless like someone has a dire question, but we, we do have to. Yeah. It doesn't really seem like being mauled by bears was as violent as we might make it out to be. Right. Like there is the, the moment where, you know, there's the staff with the snakes on it, and if you don't look at it, you're going to die. <laughs> yeah. And there's, let's wipe out all the people chasing you with the water from the Red Sea. Right. You know, the being mauled by bears might actually be pretty restrained, all things considered. <laughs> they just got mauled. Yeah. It could be worse. Uh, yeah. <laughs> That's a good point. <laughs> Interesting. <laughs> I didn't go that direction, but I like it. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Are we all good? Okay, before, be, I just yeah. want to, if, 
Just one, one uh, we, we often get our, our topics assigned. I don't know if you're aware of that or not. And we team, we team develop sermons, okay? So we all get together around a table. And, and uh, when we were doing this Stranger Things series, and we all got our topics assigned, <laughs> my thoughts were, I'm glad it's Tyler that's got this one. <laughs> <laughs> and we're usually really helpful as we go around the table with comments. And when we were trying to help uh, Tyler uh, develop his sermon, we got comments like, I got nothing. <laughs> or, uh, sucks to be you, Tyler. <laughs> and I think he's done a marvelous job here because this is a tough, tough topic. Yeah. Oh, wow. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you, Tyler.